Hey everyone, Dina here. Before the episode gets started, I wanted to just slap a big old trigger warning on it for lots of talk of childhood physical abuse and sexual abuse. So just a heads up and um, we hope you're able to enjoy the episode. everyone i'm charlotte i'm dina and welcome to the grim curriculum it's been uh, another week a little bit i think whatever it is mercury is going into retrograde but that being said i have been doing a lot of gaming in between research and whatnot yeah. and um i'm currently obsessed with a game called timberborn it's basically uh sim city but they're all beavers and they're super cute and it's a game it's in early access so it's it's a little uh chill for now but like i've been really enjoying it it's taking over my life that's honestly like the most like wholesome and canadian thing i've ever oh, heard God, you say um, uh, yeah you're it just is. playing with your cute little beavers that sounds bad oh no, no. oh no oh no, my no 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 right. well, well, <laughs> yep, yep, yep we went there <laughs> any who's all i've been playing n64 this week i've been playing paper mario oh, and man. honestly like it has been Nostalgia is healthy. I it think is. We, we all need it. I think, you know what? I've actually been looking for some new games to play, and I have been playing Horizon 2, but um, it's not, I don't know if it's just my state of mind right now. It's not really gripping me. So I'm playing like pretty mindless stuff that's like not too stressful. You don't have to get too involved. You can quit whenever you want. And it, it's good for the mental health, I think. Yeah, I actually had to like take a break from banjo and kazooie on n64 because i got to the end and it got so hard that it was just like causing me mental distress and i was like this is not the vibe i'm looking for and we went to paper mario and now all is well i find that with a lot of the like nostalgic stuff where you you think of it from when you were a kid and you're like oh my god i'm gonna play that again and then you try and then you forget how freaking hard it was it really is yeah like games back then did not hold our hands at all no, like it was not. like here's the game here's a horrible tutorial good luck you can't save also you're only renting it over the weekend yeah oh yeah true true i yeah we definitely i mean my first console unfortunately was the ps2 we had a ps2 slim and we did we definitely rented games i miss my n64 i am really probably showing my age right now but we i would get my n64 games from blockbuster and mine wow. had a popcorn machine so i get my game and my popcorn and life was good i freaking love it exactly but uh what is not good charlotte <laughs> i can't you know what i was so stunned because like i hadn't heard of this case before and you introduced me and i was like hell yeah let's do it and then oh lord almighty above this is a doozy. Here's the thing with today's case is I can tell you right now this is going to be bad. But it's going to be so much worse than you guys can even fathom right now. Yeah. I mean, like, we've all, there's a lot of bad people out there. You know, you got your, your Dahmers, your Ted Bundys. But, like, I hadn't even heard of this guy. And he's honestly probably one of the, the worst people I've ever had the displeasure of researching he's rough but there's something about him that uh just makes him stand out uh so today we're covering a serial killer and rapist known as the meanest man in america the redneck charles manson the hitchhiker's killer the boogeyman of south carolina and peewee uh yeah we are covering the one the only Peewee Gaskins. And don't let his name or the fact that he stood at a humble 5'4", 130 pounds fool you. Peewee Gaskins was one of absolutely the most terrible people that we have covered to date. He's actually so bad that it's probably going to be a while before someone takes the title of worst person we've covered. Yes, and now when it comes to confirmed kills, we're looking at about 15 people who had their lives taken by Peewee. That number is huge, but it is absolutely nothing compared to the 110 or more people that he has claimed to kill, not to mention the countless other people who had their lives absolutely ruined by this terrible man. This story has murder, mayhem, jailbreaks, the mob, uh, and so much more. Um, we're really excited to bring it to you and get all your guys' thoughts on it, because this is probably going to be like unlike anything you've ever heard before. It's certainly unlike anything I'd ever heard before. 
So, uh, yeah, grab your blanket, pet a cat, and buckle in, you guys, because this is about to get real rough. Pee Wee is going to stand out from other people we've covered for a number of reasons, but one very interesting thing about him is that he is a serial killer who really liked to talk about his crimes, so fortunately we know a fair bit. Pee Wee's autobiography, The Final Truth, goes over his crimes in horrific detail. Pee Wee spent 15 months being interviewed by author journalist Wilton Earl near the end of his life. The book's now out of print, and it's extremely hard to find, but it paints a shocking and horrific picture of what goes on in the mind of an incredibly evil man. The problem with his book is that it's considered that some of the things he talked about were untrue or exaggerated. We want to point out that when we get to the point where we're talking about things that aren't confirmed, we're going to let you know. Other than that, everything else we say about this man is the absolute truth, despite how unbelievable it is. Some folks believe that this is the reason why Pee Wee wouldn't let Wilton Earl publish his book until Pee Wee met his end in 1991. And we can't talk about Pee Wee and his book without talking about the fact that this was a man with a catchphrase. The amount of time Pee Wee ends his sentences with, uh, and that's the final truth, would be kind of funny if we weren't talking about such a, like, absolutely horrifying person. A lot about Pee Wee would be pretty funny or endearing if it wasn't Pee Wee. All right, so Pee Wee was born Donald Henry Parrott Jr. on March 13, 1933 in Florence County, South Carolina to a young, unwed, barely teenage mother named Molly. His father is actually unknown, but it is said that Pee Wee started using the last name Gaskins, which was the name of a prominent business owner who lived nearby. Pee Wee claimed that this man was his father, although many people would later say that he just picked the name because he wanted it to seem like he had a successful dad. The true identity of his father has never actually been confirmed. Donald was given the nickname Pee Wee because of his small size. When he was born, he only weighed four pounds and would remain small for the rest of his life. Pee Wee actually didn't know his name was Donald until he appeared in court when he was 13. He went by Pee Wee and Junior Parrot. When he was only a year old, Pee Wee was left unattended and somehow was able to get his hands on some kerosene, which he drank. This caused him to have terrible night terrors throughout his childhood, as well as seizures until he was three. Many people have theorized that this kind of damage to his brain may have led to his mental instability later in life, as well as his unpredictability and his fondness for violence. Pee Wee claims that his mother would regularly beat him and that he was terribly neglected. He also said that his mother would have her various boyfriends sexually abuse him and that he would constantly have to watch his mother have sex with men in front of him. The family members claim that growing up, Pee Wee was extra cute because he was so small and he was treated with kindness and he wasn't even spanked, which is a lot to say for a child growing up in South Carolina in the 30s. It was not an easy time to be a kid. When talking about his childhood in his book, uh, The Final Truth, Pee Wee said, Being born on a farm? I know the difference between raising something and it just growing. You raise tobacco and vegetables to harvest and pig and sheep to butcher. They got purpose. You tend them. But weeds grow on their own, tended or not. I grew. I wasn't raised. That's for damn sure. Hell, I didn't even know my own real name until I was a teenager and got sentenced to the reformatory. When I was younger, there was always one or another bunch of different stepdaddies around. I called them all sir and never bothered to learn most of their names because I knew my mama wasn't married to them and that they likely wouldn't be around for long. The one she finally did marry was one mean son of a bitch. He used to backhand me and knock me clean across the room just for practice. But then everybody knocked me around. My uncles, my stepdaddies, and near about all the boys and girls I played with and went to school with. They beat up on me just because I was so damn little. It wasn't that I was the littlest because I was the youngest. No matter how old I got, I was still the littlest. I never growed enough to keep up with the others. That's how I got the nickname Pee Wee. Pee Wee Pee Wee, playing with your pee pee, they used to say. And when I got mad and hit somebody, that was all the excuse they needed to gang up and beat the hell out of me. There also wasn't a ton to do for fun in South Carolina in the 30s. Unfortunately, that led to Pee Wee finding his own ways to entertain himself. And this is where our story starts to take a very, very dark turn. By the age of five, Pee Wee had already begun hurting animals for fun. He would kill baby birds and pull the heads off their parents and rip the legs off of frogs he would find. Again, this was at the age of five. Also, possibly as a result of the kerosene he drank, Pee Wee was known to wet the bed. 
This brings us to something that we are going to be talking about a lot over the course of this podcast, something called the McDonald Triad, which some of you true crime fans or psych majors may already be familiar with. But for those of you who aren't, we're going to go through it and explain it as best as we can. The McDonald Triad is a set of three factors that can be used to predict whether or not someone is likely to be associated with violent tendencies at an older age if they display at least two. The three factors are arson, bedwetting, and cruelty to animals. Pee Wee was already doing two of these, but he would engage in arson at a later age as well. If you've listened to our previous episodes, some of these traits may stand out with other killers we've covered. Not all, but a very large number of serial killers are associated with these tendencies. Some strongly believe that looking at this may be able to allow us to predict whether or not a child will grow up to be a killer. An FBI agent named John Douglas, who worked alongside these studies, says that these are not necessarily things that cause violent behavior, but they do help to predict when a child is at risk of them happening, which can allow professionals to ideally intervene with a child and help them before it's too late. As we've seen in quite a few of these cases, a lot of the time the warning signs for a person are already there in childhood. And like with anything, there are people that are going to disagree that this is a viable way to predict violent behavior. Further studies tell us that these behaviors may be more linked to childhood abuse and neglect, which some argue can cause a child to grow up to be violent. Either way, Pee Wee did display two of the three. However, I don't think anyone at this point would know just how terrible little Pee Wee would grow up to be. Due to his small size, Pee Wee was bullied a lot in school. He was beaten up by the other kids fairly regularly, and he would end up dropping out of school at the age of 11 to work in an auto body shop. Apparently, he was actually pretty skilled at working on vehicles, even at a young age. This is something that he would continue to do for the majority of his free life, although the majority of his future work with cars would involve stealing them, stripping them, and selling them for parts rather than fixing and helping people. He did have some friends, and they would hang out at an old abandoned shack they called The Hideout. Pee Wee claims that they would sit around and smoke stolen cigarettes while they talked about girls, and that sometimes they would steal food or candy from vending machines to enjoy while they hung out. Which doesn't seem all that horrible. However, he also claims that he would watch the older boys have sex with sheep, goats, or even chickens, as well as each other and the younger kids on a regular basis, amongst other things. The group started out as a larger number of younger and older boys, but due to some of the things we're going to talk about and some of the things we already talked about, that number dwindled very quickly down to only two other boys named Danny and Marsh. The three boys called themselves the Trouble Trio. And while that sounds like a cute little childhood gang, we have to remember who we're talking about. They originally got caught peeping into an outhouse at church, but it got much worse very quickly. The boys were beaten by their parents for this, and Pee Wee later stated that he didn't really feel sorry for what he had done, but that he was sad that he had been caught. This wouldn't be the first time Pee Wee would show little to no remorse for the terrible things that he had done. And we just want to quickly remind you that we are talking about someone known as the meanest man in America, and this story is going to get real messed up real fast. So heads up for that. Uh... Pee Wee claims that he lost his virginity to a sex worker shortly after meeting the boys. Ah, not virginity. You're gonna notice very quickly that Pee Wee Gaskins had a very interesting vocabulary. For example, when he talked about losing his virginity, he didn't use that word. He called it losing his pussy fuck cherry to a whore. He would also call regular sex a love fuck. Charming. I think uh, that is one of the things that also makes Pee Wee stand out. He's one of those people that when they talk, you just kind of have to take a second and kind of rework everything you just heard because it just doesn't sound real. Absolutely. So anyways, despite their young age, they were an absolute menace. The Trouble Trio was known for causing havoc and burglarizing homes. They would even steal cars so that they could drive to Charleston, where the army base was, to pick up sex workers. They would also sexually abuse other little boys on a very regular basis. They were even known to threaten them and scare them into not going to the police. The kids knew who the Trouble Trio were, and they were absolutely terrified of them. One of the boys, Marsh, who was the older of the three, was particularly fond of the younger boys in the group and would engage in sex acts with them on a regular basis. The Trouble Trio sounds like a cute little group of ragtag kids, but in reality, they were a bunch of psychopathic children who seemed to hurt anyone and everything in their path. They seriously sound like something straight from a horror movie. And it gets worse. 
One day, the boys decided that they were tired of having sex with each other and with women that they were paying and that they wanted to have sex with a virgin. They decided that their victim would be none other than Marsha's younger sister. The three of them violently assaulted her and threatened to kill her if she told anyone. Absolute fucking monsters. Luckily, the girl told her parents almost immediately, but the parents didn't go to the police. They decided to make their own justice, and they tied up the boys. They then beat the absolute crap out of them. The parents of the boys all agreed that the boys shouldn't spend any more time together, and the Trouble Trio was thankfully permanently split up. It is said that the other boys would actually redeem themselves later and stop committing any crimes at all. But that was just the beginning for little Pee Wee. Things would only go downhill from here. Way downhill. Like, exponentially downhill. By the age of 13 years old, Pee Wee was already starting to become what we would consider a career criminal. He had left school two years ago and held down some employment, but his line of work would be robbing houses. Pee Wee had learned that the best time to rob a house was when the family was away at a funeral or a wedding. On this occasion, the family of a girl he knew was away at a funeral one town over. Pee Wee, expecting the house to be empty, broke in that he could steal some valuables from them. Little did he know, the girl had stayed home that day. She immediately recognized him. She knew who he was, and she knew what kind of reputation he had. The story of what he had done to his friend's sister had spread around the town. She attacked him with an axe. A struggle began, and unfortunately, he was able to overpower her and get the axe. He hit her in the arm, and then the head, knocking her out. Pee Wee, seeing what he had done, ran away, but he was quickly identified. Pee Wee was arrested, and as he stood in court at the age of 13, he heard the name Donald Henry Gaskins for the very first time and was shocked to learn that they were actually talking to him. He had absolutely no idea that his name wasn't Pee Wee or Junior. Pee Wee was sent to serve his sentence at the South Carolina Industrial School for Boys until his 18th birthday. Pee Wee's time here would be filled with horrific abuse from the other boys because of his small size and difficulty defending himself. The abuse started as soon as he arrived, and on his first night there, Pee Wee was violently assaulted by 20 other boys at once. This led to Pee Wee becoming the property of a boy they called Boss Poss, who was older and bigger than him. Boss Poss would trade Pee Wee to other inmates to be used however they wanted, sometimes for something as small as a single cigarette. Pee Wee would also fall victim to abuse from Boss Poss himself. Pee Wee was not the only boy there who was being traded to the bigger boys. About a year into his sentence, he got together with four other boys who were sick and tired of being abused, and they formed a plan to escape. The four boys were caught almost instantly, but Pee Wee, being smaller and quicker, was able to make his way into the swamps until he was captured later. He would try to escape a total of four times. Each time that he was caught, he was beaten by guards and further abused by the other boys. The fourth time was the charm because Pee Wee was actually able to escape and get a job at a traveling carnival. Surprisingly enough, thanks to Boss Poss, who had an uncle who worked there, Pee Wee was given a job setting up and taking down rides and tents. Can I just say, personally, I would not get on a ride if Pee Wee Gaskins was in charge no. of making sure that it was set no, up no, properly. No. Oh my god. No. <laughs> Wildly enough, actually, Pee-wee and Boss Poss, they would put their differences aside. Wild. When Boss Poss got out, the two began working together at the carnival. They became really close friends, and that friendship would last decades until Boss Poss died in a tragic suicide. At the age of 17, Pee-wee met the first of his six wives, Mary, who was a fellow carnival worker. Mary did not approve of Pee-wee being on the run, and she wanted to live a regular, non-carnival-related life. She convinced Pee Wee to return to the South Carolina in Industrial School for Boys and finish his sentence, which he actually did. That's wild to me. I honestly wonder how she was able to convince him to return to such a nightmarish place that he fought so hard to escape from. I guess that's love, baby. Yep. <laughs> One year later, upon his release, a psychiatrist evaluated Pee Wee and reported that he was by no means ready to be released and that they believed he was very dangerous. They wrote... We consider him to be dangerous and also believe he has the homicidal tendencies peculiar to the paranoid type. Despite that, Pee Wee was released anyway when he returned 18. He immediately found work at a tobacco farm and he also found himself a brand new wife. This one was only 13 years old. Jeez. 
Uh, Pee Wee wasn't happy working in the fields and wanted to make more money. He soon became involved in an insurance scam. Basically, the owner of the barn would pay Pee Wee and some other men to burn the farm down so that they could collect the insurance money. They would steal the tobacco from the barn before burning it and sell it, giving half the profits to the barn owner. So they would get paid, and the barn owner would not only get the insurance money, but half of the money from the stolen goods. It's actually a pretty elaborate plan. The tobacco farm was sold on to someone new, and Pee Wee now had a new, and it seems like a less criminally inclined boss. Pee Wee, who by now I'm sure you realize had an incredibly short fuse, was out working in the fields one day when the daughter of the landowner started making fun of him for his size and suggested that he had burned the barn down. Pee Wee, upon hearing this, panicked, and he picked up a hammer that was nearby. He hit her in the head with it, splitting her skull and almost killing her. He was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon and attempted murder. He was very quickly found guilty and was sentenced to serve five years at the South Carolina Penitentiary. And I was pretty shocked that it was only five years for attempted murder, but Dina actually explained to me just before we started recording that that's not that unusual. No. So I, I honestly, I, I think even for how violent this was with my personal experience working in corrections in the past, five years for an attempted murder is pretty decent sentence, which is terrifying. Absolutely bonkers. Um, we're also going to add that it was around this time that his daughter Shirley was born. We'll get to her a little later, but basically Shirley would actually stand by her father until the very end. Along with multiple wives, Pee Wee had multiple families, and he actually had pretty decent relationships with his daughters, who he would affectionately call half pint and half chicken. One of his daughters, whose real name was Shirley, would stand by her father until the end, even though she believed every single word her father had said. Not that this will surprise anyone, but the South Carolina Penitentiary was not a great place for Pee Wee at all, or any of the other inmates. It was originally built in 1886, and by 1916, more than half of the prisoners kept there were under the age of 12. It would stay open for almost 130 years before its closure in the 1990s due to severe overcrowding. To give you an idea of how dangerous it was there, the average person serving time there was serving around 23 years, whereas the state average elsewhere was around 12 years. It was the site of some absolutely terrible things and housed incredibly dangerous people. 16 years prior to Pee Wee arriving, six inmates were charged with murder and executed by an electric chair for the death of a guard during an escape. Despite how bad the reputation of this place was, Pee Wee would still find a way to earn his name amongst the cruelest and most dangerous men there. And an interesting fact about the South Carolina Penitentiary is that it had its own cemetery. This wasn't too far out of the norm for prisons at the time, but their cemetery was said to have at least 1,900 inmates buried in and around it, with only a shocking 279 of them ever being identified to this day. Can I just say, I think that makes it so much more sad, horrific, whatever, considering that you said the average age of the prisoners there was 12, and, like, there's 1,900 potentially, like, basically children buried in this cemetery. And it's not even that. It's when you look up the, the penitentiary, which I did when we were working on this episode, it's under the age of 12. Oh so it's really, you're looking at what really should have been an adult institution with a mass grave. And it's not just the graveyard. There's graves kind of around the property that were found too. And I don't know if they're ever going to try to identify these people or if they've just kind of been lost to history, but it really kind of gives you an idea of the kind of place that Pee Wee was going into. Awful. Pee Wee was basically, once again, the subject of violent physical and sexual abuse from other inmates due to his small size. He very quickly realized that he needed some kind of protection if he was going to survive at the South Carolina pen, and he needed it quick. Okay, I just want to say also, I always find this kind of like moral conflict because you hear of Pee Wee going through... and. Many other serial killers also had really horrific childhoods and whatnot, but in this case, because we're talking about Pee Wee, he goes through all this horrific stuff, you know, the assaults and all this awful shit in jail, and you feel really sorry for him, but then on the flip side, he's also been a pretty terrible person 
since like day one in a way like you know at five years old pulling the wings off of birds and stuff like things kind of went downhill for him as soon as he drank that kerosene i mean really it's well and we talk about like the mcdonald triad and that it's uh arson bedwetting and hurting animals but um a big thing with serial killers and people of violent tendencies is often a brain injury yep. particularly to the frontal lobe because that's where your personality center is and you wonder what the, yeah, the kerosene did to his brain. It, it's just those ingredients to that, like, make a perfect serial killer recipe, right? Like, you got the abuse you throw in, he's got the brain injury, he has potentially a neglected childhood. There's really a lot of stuff that goes against him from the start, and then he gets here, and then everything is just going to get so much worse from here that he is going to turn into the absolute monster we know him as today. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's sad is all you can say, amongst other things, of course, but yeah. So being there, Pee Wee knew that because of his size, he couldn't just find the biggest person there and fight them and win and earn the respect of everyone else. So he had to do something dramatic. He needed to become what he called a power man. And what the hell, you may ask, is a power man? Well, a power man, at least a peewee, was someone who no one else dare mess with. Someone violent, dangerous, and unpredictable. And peewee, always the overachiever, chose the biggest, baddest man that he could find. A man named Hazel Brazel. Hazel Brazel was known for being an incredibly violent man who was never seen without at least two other men around that would protect him or fight for him whenever he needed it. Peewee was substantially smaller and weaker than any of his men, so he went for another approach. What Peewee lacked in size, he made up for in charm, and so he attempted to befriend them. Peewee would sometimes work in the kitchen, and he would bring Hazel and his men food sometimes. This eventually earned the trust of Hazel, and he was allowed to be in his cell. Peewee did this numerous times until he felt their trust was earned. Despite what a horrible man he was, many people who knew him would report that Pee-wee knew when to lay down the charm, and he was really good at making people like him. I mean, he somehow convinced six separate people to marry him, so... One day, Pee-wee saw that Hazel was using the washroom while one of his men was guarding him outside. Pee-wee asked if he could speak to Hazel, and Hazel shouted, Let that little piss ant in, and allowed Pee-wee into the bathroom where they were alone. Because the men wore prison jumpsuits, Hazel was essentially completely naked and sitting on the toilet. A charming image, I'm sure you can all agree. Pee-wee walked up to him, immediately stabbed him in the neck with a knife he had stolen from the kitchen. He tore through his neck towards his Adam's apple, killing him before anyone realized what was going on. Pee-wee somehow convinced the guards that he had killed him in self-defense, and because of that, Pee-wee was served with a lesser sentence of manslaughter rather than first-degree murder or murder committed with intent and planning. Pee-wee was given a nine-year prison sentence, but it was set to run at the same time as his current sentence, so he ended up only really serving an extra three years for the murder. Again, pretty nuts considering he's attempted to kill three people already and succeeded with one of them. Absolutely. <laughs> And along with the time added, Pee-wee was sent to solitary confinement for six months, which in itself sounds like a complete nightmare. However, when Pee-wee got out, he was absolutely delighted to see that he was now considered by the un other inmates to be a power man. Because of this, he was now left alone by the other inmates and was given his own inmates to do whatever he wanted to with. It's no secret that solitary confinement is incredibly rough on a person's mental health and overall well-being, despite whatever kind of person you were when you went in. Spending time in solitary can lead to depression, anxiety, paranoia, psychosis, and often leads to self-injury or, you know, even suicide. It's still widely practiced today in prisons around the world. In 1955, while Pee-wee was still serving time, he was given the terrible news that his wife wanted a divorce. Pee-wee was absolutely devastated by this, and he immediately set to break out of prison to see her. The way that he broke out is actually kind of funny. Because of his power man status, Pee-wee was able to call on other inmates for favors. He was able to sneak into a small garbage container that was being sent to the dump. I feel like that's appropriate. Because he was so small, the guards never thought to check anyone sneaking out in the garbage. Lucky for Pee-wee, he fit perfectly. He even threw a bunch of fresh prison trash on top of him to hide himself better. 
And it worked. Pee Wee fled on foot into the woods and he eventually made it to a gas station that his cousin David worked at. He saw David's car sitting in the parking lot with the keys still in it and he stole it. He was on his way to Florida to get Mary back. But he can't have been that devastated because for whatever reason, Pee Wee never made it. Instead, he met up with Boss Poss once again in Lake Wales, Florida. Pee Wee needed money, so he hit the road with Boss Poss and they eventually headed back to South Carolina. It was around this time that Pee Wee would learn how to strip cars and sell the parts for money, which would be his main source of income for the majority of his life that wasn't spent in jail. He said he learned this from a husband and wife duo who ran the local girly shows. Ooh la la. Around this time, Pee Wee found love once again when he met Junie Alice Holden. Not much is known about her, but the marriage didn't last long. Three weeks after they married, the two decided to go their separate ways. Pee Wee wasn't too upset because he had his eye on a carnival woman by the name of Betty Gates, also known as Xena from Zanzibar. Pee Wee was pretty enamored by her and she quickly convinced him to do her a small favor. She needed someone to drive her to Cookville, Tennessee to bail her brother out of jail. Pee Wee gladly did this and when they arrived, she sent him to the prison with some bail money and cigarettes for her brother to smoke while he waited to be processed. Unfortunately, Betty had failed to mention two pretty big things. One, there was a hidden razor blade in the cigarette package, and two, the man was not her brother. He was her husband. Pee Wee had absolutely no idea any of this was going on and had no clue that he was helping the man escape. When he returned to the hotel that they were staying at, Betty was gone and his stolen car had been stolen from him. The next morning, Pee Wee woke up to the police at his bed. He tried to convince them that he was his cousin David and that someone had stolen his car, but the police quickly figured out who it was and sent him back to serve the rest of his sentence along with an additional few months for helping Betty's husband escape. He was later charged by the FBI for driving a stolen car across state lines and he was given an additional three years. He was sent to a federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia, where he would meet the wise men. And that, friends, is where we will pick up next week with part two of the story of Pee Wee Gaskins, the meanest man in America. This is our first ever two-part series. Yay! Honestly, there's so much information to get here, and we didn't want to leave anything out, especially considering, like, straight up, the worst is yet to come. We haven't even gotten to the crimes that would make Pee Wee Gaskins go down in history as the incredibly evil man that we know him to be. Nope. And believe it or not, we haven't even gotten to the tip of the iceberg. Seriously. This story is only going to get a whole lot worse from here on out. So I guess in that sense, the good news is that you have an entire week to yeah. emotionally and mentally prepare yourself for the uh, horror that we're going to be bringing you in part two. You're going to need it. And we warned you, so. Yeah, we absolutely we did. You. We did our duty. We normally like to go over our thoughts on the case, but we're going to hold off until the very end of the series before we do that. So next week, we're going to pick up where we left off with Pee Wee meeting the wise men and continuing on his life of crime, devastation, and absolute bonkers chaos. Make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm Ominous underscore Walrus on Twitter and Ominous Walrus on Instagram. And I'm Dina V on Twitch, Dina V IG on Instagram, and Dina V tweets on Twitter. And if you've been with us this long and you like us, and we sure hope you do, please consider giving us a five-star review on Spotify. It really helps. Do it. And also, like, if you're the person or the people, I should say, that are watching us along on YouTube, feel free to give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We're real close to getting up to 100 subscribers, which means we get a custom URL, which would be very helpful and uh, it would just make everything nice and consistent and aesthetically pleasing. Uh, apart from that, anything else we want to add? We're just out here trying to be a big girl podcast, and we can't <laughs> do that without you guys, so thank you for the love, thank you for the support, yes. and uh, for those of you who don't know, every Saturday we do a live premiere on our YouTube channel, so if you're listening on another platform, join us sometime. We have a really good time, yeah. and it's been super fun. Yeah, our podcast uh, releases on YouTube, and well, everywhere else, on Saturdays at noon, uh, I guess Mountain Standard Time, Alberta Time. So you can do the math and figure out wherever it is in the world that you're listening from. Uh, either way, we appreciate having you guys along for the listen. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, guys. You are awesome. We appreciate you. This has been The, the Grim, Grim Curriculum. Curriculum.